Hey Bethel, thanks for joining us today. My name is Wayne Stender. I've been going to Bethel for over 20 years now, which seems weird to say that out loud. But uh, I wanted to greet you today and tell you about one of the special offerings that we're doing here at Bethel as part of a special uh, cohort option for us uh, through the Colson Fellows Program. It's a worldview training program for adults. It's a 10 month program. We'll read books, um, you'll be mentored, we'll get to do some small group things together and have an opportunity to really engage uh, what's happening in our world, get some training for that, and then have an opportunity to uh, have a three-year ministry plan after that. The goal is not just to know worldview, but to understand what we can do with that here in our home church. So there's a few important meetings that are uh, very vital for the life of our church as we move forward with this building campaign that we're part of to expand our property that's really exciting in what God is doing in our community. So the first one is today, May 2nd, as we're going to be voting on a guaranteed maximum price uh, for the costs of building and the costs related to the expansion project. So we'd love to have you show up for that. And then in two weeks, we'll be voting on May 16th, the mortgaging of the property here at Bethel and what that means for us as we expand the ministry of Bethel, but also uh, engage that building project. Thanks for joining us today. Now we're gonna hear from Pastor Dave. Well, greetings to all of you, and uh, thanks for joining us today here at Bethel. Yeah, it's good to have you with. Um, a special greeting to those of you joining in Bethel Battle Lake. It was great to be with you last Sunday, to worship with you, to hear you sing. And uh, yeah, anyway, thank you. And, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to preaching this morning. Before we dive into God's word, uh, would, you, would you bow your heads and pray with me? Let's, let's talk to the Lord. Jesus, thank you for this day. Uh, thanks for the chance to live and move and have our being because of you. Uh, you love us so much, and today is an opportunity for that love of God for us to be shown through, through Scripture and through the preached word. So help, help us, help me to be faithful to your word and um, open your word to us, Lord Jesus, and us to your word as we look at it today. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you have a Bible, I'm going to invite you to grab it and turn to Colossians chapter 1. That's where we are today as we continue in this series called Crosswords, looking at words that describe us because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. So Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read starting at verse 19. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Colossians 1, 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in, in him, that is in Jesus, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present to you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. This is God's word. Please, you may be seated. What a great passage of scripture for us to dive into today. Uh, and so if you've got your bulletin, on the front cover of your bulletin, you can find the shaded boxes right there in the center and fill in today's crossword. Today's crossword is reconciled. Reconciled. Write it in. R-E-C-O-N-C-I-L-E-D. Reconciled means, it means that the broken relationship is made whole again. It means that enemies are made friends again. And so, if, if the incarnation is how Jesus came into the world, then reconciliation is why Jesus came into the world. How do I know this? Well, you told me that several months ago. Do you remember? I mean, I heard you. We all heard you say it. Do you remember what you said? This is what you said. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. I won't keep singing. <laughs> Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners. What's the word? Say it with me. 
reconciled. Right. So today what I want to do is I want to talk about reconciled, what it means to be reconciled to God. I want to talk about it by asking the text that we have today three questions. One, how do we, or why, why do we need to be reconciled? How can we be reconciled? And then, so what? What is the result of being reconciled? So first, why do we need to be reconciled? Um, In fact, do we need to be reconciled? I mean, we all have relationships that are broken, right? We all struggle. We all have conflicts sometimes with, with God, with, with kids, with spouse, with neighbors, with coworkers, with friends. I mean, we always have conflict. That's just part of life. But you know what? I mean, is it such a big deal? Can we, just, can we just work it out on our own? I mean, right? I mean, how bad could it be? Can we just, can we just work it out? Can we fix this? Well, how do you exactly work it out? You know, what does that look like? What does our working it out look like? I want to tell you the story of, of a friend of mine named Kyle. Um, Kyle and I were classmates when we were kids. Um, we were friends. Uh, one of the reasons I think we were friends is because we both love basketball, and Kyle had a basketball hoop uh, on his garage, at his, on his driveway at his house. I didn't have a basketball hoop at my house, and he had one, so we spent a lot of time playing hoops together over at his house. And we were pretty competitive with one another, so we didn't always get along, right? In fact, one time in in the sixth grade, we both got sent to the principal's office because we got into a fight out on the playground because we were playing a game of four square, and he cheated, and I called him out on it, and he got just hopping mad at me. So we both got sent to the principal's office. He just blew up. This is what he did. Kyle was kind of a hothead. And it was, I think it was like two years after that day we got sent to the principal's office and I understood kind of why and what was going on with him. Uh, Kyle's home life was full of broken relationships. Enemies were living together in his home. Enemies. Uh, His home didn't provide for him the peace and stability that a young boy deserves and that he needs to thrive and do well in life. He didn't have that. And this became clear When in the fall of 1982, Kyle's older brother, Sean, was arrested for shooting their dad. It actually came out that Kyle's mom and brother, Sean, actually tried to hire someone to kill the dad. Twice they tried to hire somebody, and it didn't work out so One October morning, Kyle's older brother, Sean, got up early and lay in wait behind the house. Waiting for dad to wake up, get dressed, head out the door as he normally does, to head out the side door between the house and the garage uh, and make his way to work. And that's where Sean was waiting. And when his dad came out of the house, he shot him four times. Shot him four times from the back. From between the house and the garage, he shot him, and as the dad stumbled across the driveway where we, Kyle and I, would shoot hoops all the time, he was shot in the back of the head with a twenty-two, In the back of the head, in the back of the neck, in the back of the right arm, and and his his lower back and left, on the left side. Four times. Uh, Mr. Renahan, uh, Kyle's dad, tried to, t- to get away, tried to run from his son shooting at him. He hopped over, managed to hop over a fence into the neighbor's yard, and it was just a mess. Here's the thing that sticks out to me now. I had no idea what was going on in that home. Like, no idea the problems and the brokenness and the tension and the conflict that was there. I had no idea that the cops had been called to this house several times in the seven or eight months previous to this shooting. No idea. And nobody really did. No one really knew how broken the relationships were in their family until one day, until, until one day everybody knew. Right? So, reconciliation. Do we need that? Are our, are our relationships messed up in this world? Do we really need reconciliation with one another, with, with God? Yeah, yeah, we do. 
You want to know why? We need reconciliation because the relationships, like the relationships in Kyle's house, things are worse than they seem with us. Things are worse than they seem. We're clueless about how bad things really are in our interpersonal relationships and in our relationship with God. Conflict and broken relationships are everywhere, hiding in plain sight, and our ways of working it out usually create more harm than good. We don't see the conflict that lives in people's homes. Even more difficult is to see the conflict that lives in the heart of every person. And so Paul describes the invisible conflict that we have with God like this. He says, you were alienated from God and were enemies. Well, how's that for just calling it the way it is? Let's not beat around the bush. Let's just call it out until Jesus came to make reconciliation between God and man possible. We weren't just people with bad habits. You know, we weren't people who just make mistakes once in a while. We were enemies with God. We were his enemies. Our relationship with God is so much worse than we thought. Without Jesus, we are God's enemies. We live in active opposition to God. In fact, Paul says to the Romans in chapter 5, verse 10, this. This exact same thing. He says, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him. When were we reconciled? Not when we were just struggling, you know, we were like kind of have a troubled waters in our relationship with God. Things were not, you know, on just the way we wanted them to be. No, 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 no. We, they were so bad, we were his enemies. That's when reconciliation came for us. See, it's, it's, it's worse than you think. I mean, let's not downplay the problem. Because if we downplay the problem, the solution has been downplayed as well. So what, 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 if we're his enemies, actively and rebelliously opposing God, then what are the consequences of that? In terms of the relationship, what are the consequences of that? Here, here's how I want you to think about that. I want you to imagine somebody who's broken the law. Somebody breaks the law. Now, laws are, are designed to do what? To, to keep the peace. Like it's, they're designed to, to help us learn how to live with one another. And when we follow the laws, everybody gets along. You and I will do great if you don't, you know, shoot my dog or hurt my kids or do donuts on my front lawn or whatever. You know, like, we'll get along great if you, if you keep the rules. And, and if I keep the rules, everything will be fine. But let's just say somebody breaks the law. When somebody breaks the law, that person then is in a state of being unreconciled to the people of the community, right? He's unreconciled with people, specific people who is, whom he has offended, but also the community at large, the society, Now, suppose that that person comes, a person who has broken the law, and he comes and he says, sincerely, he says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What is the community, through the judicial system, going to say to that person? I'll tell you what they're going to say. They're going to say, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry is not enough. It's a great start. But the fact is, there is still a debt of justice that needs to be paid to society. Sorry is not enough. If you hurt someone, the person whom you hurt might forgive you. If you steal something, the offended might forgive you. But forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. They're distinct from one another. Forgiveness is brought to you, how? Cradled in the arms of mercy. Reconciliation is brought to you, how? Cradled in the arms of justice. You see, sinners need forgiveness. Enemies need reconciliation. And in Jesus, you get both. I mean, you get both. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have both in Jesus Christ. So, why do we need it? Oh, man, there's brokenness. Have we established that? Do, are we all on the same page? Have, we, have I established our need for reconciliation? Th- then let's move to the second, which is how then can we be reconciled? I mean, what accomplishes the healing of our relationship with God? Who, what, 
pays the debt of justice that we owe. Paul tells us this. He says, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, underline this, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's what we see. As Paul typically does, he's pulling this this Old Testament thread forward and into the New Testament for us to see how both the Old and the New Testament come together, showing us that there really is just one way for people to be in a right relationship with God. And you know what that is? You know what's required to be in a right relationship with God? The shedding of blood. The shedding of blood. And you say, and you say in our, we in our 21st century sensibilities say, well, that seems kind of extreme. Well, so is the problem. And extreme problems call for extreme remedies. The shedding of blood. Think with me for a minute uh, about this text in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. We read there, it says, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now, um, let's underline the word atonement, okay? What does that mean? That's actually another very good, we're not, we don't have it in our series, but it's a very good, it's a very good uh, 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 crossword is what it is. The word atonement, uh, underline it. The word atonement comes from the Middle English, A-T-T-O-N-E, and it literally means at one, at one, together, right? We would say to be at one is to be in agreement with, to be at peace with someone. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament teach that blood is the payment required for peace between us and God. That, that it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. In In fact, in in Leviticus 16, I want us to look at this for a second together. In Leviticus chapter 16, we read about something called the scapegoat. Have have you ever heard that phrase? You've heard it. You've used it. Someone someone so is the scapegoat. This is the one who gets the blame instead of somebody else. And we blame that person. We blame the scapegoat. Where does that story come from? I want to tell you a little bit of that background today. Um, in Leviticus chapter 16, we read about the scapegoat, and there it talks about the fact that there were there were to be two goats that were chosen, and together they would be one sin offering. And and through these goats, reconciliation or peace with God would be achieved. Here's how this would happen. Um, God provided for this. He said, one of these goats is to be killed. For one of these goats is to be killed, and its blood is to be sacrificed for the sins of all the people. But behind closed doors, so to speak, right? In in the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go, this would take place. But then God said, "I, I know how you need to see exactly what's going on. So he says, I want you to know. And, and see exactly how far I am removing your sins from you. And just how complete a salvation I'm providing. So he says, there, there needs to be another goat. That's the scapegoat. And he says this. He basically gave this instruction to the high priest. All right, here, here it is. He says, chapter 16, verse 21. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat. The scapegoat. And confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. I mean, picture this. Then he shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place. And the man shall release it in the wilderness. Okay. Wow, right? Like, did you hear? Did, I mean, did you hear what I just read? Did, can you imagine being there? Like, seriously, can you imagine being in that situation? I was thinking, what would this look like? So you got, you got the priest. You got a goat. And you got the priest. And he, can you see him? He's getting down and he's, he's placing ceremoniously both hands on the head of the goat. And the people are all watching. 
And they're all seeing what's going on. And as he sees the people behind, out there beyond the goat, he's, he's talking to the goat. He's saying to the goat, I don't know, is he, is he, is he whispering in his ear? Is he, what is he saying? He's placing, he's confessing the sins of all the people. His mouth is moving, and the words being spoken over the goat are the confession of the sins of all the people that are watching. All the sins placed on the goat. And then he stands up, and he hands the goat to somebody else, and somebody else takes the goat, and off they go into the wilderness. Off they go, out of town and out of sight. And can you imagine if, if parents are watching this with their kids and they're saying, Daddy, Mommy, what's going on? And they say, listen, did you see how the priest, he put all of your sins, every evil thought, word, and action you've ever done. And he spoke with just words. With words, he gathered up all of your sin and he put it on the goat and there it goes, out of town and out of sight. There goes your sin. Your shame is no longer yours. Your shame is walking out of town and out of sight. Your guilt is no longer yours. Why? Because your guilt is walking out of town and out of sight. I was thinking of this and I was thinking... How lucky are they, right? I mean, how lucky are they? Wouldn't it be nice to have a scapegoat like that? Wouldn't it be nice to have one on whom you could lay your hands and confess your sins? One who would walk away, far from you, forever away, with your sin, with your shame, and with your guilt. Wouldn't that be nice? Can I... Can I tell you what, you, by now you already are guessing? Jesus is your scapegoat. Jesus is your scapegoat. He is the one to take away your sin and your shame and your guilt. So now, if that's what God does for us in Jesus, what is the result of this reconciliation that he has provided for us? Paul tells us. He says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Did you hear what I just said? You are holy in God's sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. You know, I have to admit that I've been thinking a lot about this, and I, this is too wonderful for me to understand. Like, too wonderful for me to understand. Like, I understand it. Like, I'm trying to explain it to you, right? So there's a level of understanding, but it's too wonderful for me to understand. Same with you. Anybody else like, yeah, I don't, I don't get it either. To be presentable to God, to be made presentable to God, how is that possible? To stand before God free from accusation, God looks and says, Dave, I got nothing on you. Welcome. What? Nothing? I, I got a few things that you could use against me. No, I got nothing. It's gone. Out of town. Out of sight. I don't understand this. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't pretend to plumb the depths of it, but here's what I do understand. Implicit in this text for us today is an invitation. And the invitation is this. First of all, to see things as they really are. That they're really worse than you thought. Like the relationships in Kyle's home Things are worse than they seem. In our home down here, in our home right here, things are worse than they seem. Don't downplay it. But the second invitation is this. To lay your hands on Jesus. To lay your hands on Jesus. To confess 
over his sacred head now wounded all your sins. To see his blood paying the debt of justice that you owe. To see his body led away and placed in a tomb, taking with him out of town and out of sight all of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt. So that now as God looks at you, here's what he sees. He sees you as holy in his sight and free from accusation. (laughs) Good news? Good news. Good enough to make you want to sing? Well, what would we sing? Well, we might sing this. Hark the herald, angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. Say it with me. God and sinners reconciled. We might sing that. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for what you have done for us, for reconciling sinners who don't deserve it with you, for providing and paying all that's required to pay our debt, our sin debt. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and being our substitute, for being our scapegoat, for taking our sins far from us, out of town and out of sight, never to return, placed in the tomb, sealed. Thank you. Gone forever. Lord Jesus, help us to believe this good word. Help us to receive it from you now. Create faith in us to believe this for us. In Jesus' name I pray and for his glory. Amen and amen. So now, as you've heard this good word spoken over you today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God's peace be with you. Thanks for joining us today for our church service here online. We have a few discussion questions that Pastor Dave has posted here at the end of the video. So we encourage you to stick around uh, and watch those with your family and engage your community around you with those questions. We also have online giving if you'd like to continue to join the ministry here that's happening at Bethel. We invite you to do that. So thanks for watching church with us tonight, um, participating in it, and we look forward to uh, interacting with you throughout the course of the weeks and months ahead.